excited about the word today. I uh, so honored to any time to be able to bring the word of God. But we are now wrapping up a 40-week uh, study that we've done together as a church through the Bible Engagement Plan. And uh, what a ride it's been. 66 books of the Bible. We've done kind of like a low flyby over the whole Bible in the last 40 weeks. The opening scenes of creation, Adam and Eve and Abraham and Noah and the flood and David and Goliath and all the battles and the prophecies and the sin and the failure and God always working to bring his people back to himself. We see that throughout, throughout the whole scriptures, fires and plagues and then the birth of Jesus, the miraculous birth of Jesus, the miracles he did, the teachings, his death and resurrection, the birth of the church, 2,000 years of his church on the planet and uh, it's been quite a ride, hasn't it, to, to take this together. But today I get to do the, the I told Mike the crowning glory. He asked me a few weeks ago if I would do this. They're uh, still up where we were at a memorial service for a family member, and uh, they'll be back tonight. But um, I'm going to look into the book of Revelation and, and look at the whole teaching of new heavens and a new earth. How many of you think it's probably going to be a good idea to have God do new heavens and a new earth for us when all of this is wrapped up and Jesus returns and uh, brings us to himself. And uh, the book of Revelation, it's an interesting book because the Bible, it starts out with this, blessed are they that read and hear the words of this prophecy and keep their eyes on it. I would just say to you, I'll be doing a few verses out of Revelation today, but in these days in what, which we're living it wouldn't hurt to take at least one once a month and just read through the whole book. It takes about 90 minutes, I think, to read through the whole book if you read fairly quickly. But uh, because we've got a lot to look forward to. How many of you like to have things to look forward to? You know, like vacation or maybe a, a new car. Or, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I looked forward to uh, the weekends and vacations. I looked forward to when I could get my driver's license more than anything, and I did get on my 16th birthday, I got my driver's license. And then I looked forward to having a girlfriend and then getting married. In fact, I married my girlfriend 54 years ago. And, uh, and then, you know, having kids and have, have the kids. And then grandkids have 10 of those. And then great-grandkids have three of those. So it's kind of like the Lord, you, you could almost take me to heaven any time now. I don't, I don't know if we'll be around for great-great-grandkids or not. But... But how do you know what I'm saying? It's just, it, we love to look forward to things. If I said to you today, now we're uh, leasing a 747, and all expenses paid, we're all going to get on that puppy, and we're going to spend three weeks in Hawaii, and we're going to do boating, and, you know, and uh, we'll take care of everything at home for you. We, you. You'd look forward to that, wouldn't you? Most of you would look forward to that. Well, we got something even incredibly more amazing to look forward to. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to ask you this. How do you think about heaven? Pastor Mike's message last week was so powerful. In fact, it was, it was prophetic in nature, just calling us to a new awareness of uh, the return of the Lord and the things that are yet ahead for his people. In fact, I heard a story. I don't know if it's true or not, but it makes a point. So a pastor was preaching... Uh, to his congregation, and he was preaching about heaven and hell and how to get to heaven. And, and so he said, all of you that want to get to heaven, I want you to come forward right now. So people started coming forward, and he kept kind of driving the point home. Come on, any of you that want to go to heaven, come down the front right now. And so finally, everyone was up there except a little boy, Billy, 10 years old. And he said, Billy, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, yes, Pastor. Eventually, I thought you were getting up a load right now. <laughs> and, we, and we have people often that, that uh, we say, heaven, think about it. I, I have enough trouble just keeping track of every day in my life, you know, let alone thinking about heaven. But I want us to uh, do that this morning. I'm going to read the text, and then we'll dive into this together. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. I just want you to pause for a moment and imagine God himself comes down with a white linen towel on his, on his arm, and he himself personally wipes those tears from your eyes. There's been a lot of tears. A lot of you have shed a lot of tears even recently. God sees those tears. They're a language to him. They're a prayer to him. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow. Can I hear a hallelujah out there? No more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Now, I'm, I'm reading tomorrow's news, brothers and sisters. I'm more accurate. I was going to start naming the, the uh, well-known news uh, disseminating people, but I won't. <laughs> so, but... This is tomorrow's news. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. At the very end, we're going to deal with that that verse and show you what God is really saying to us there. Thinking about heaven and focusing on heaven. In Colossians, Paul told the people, he said, he said, I want you to seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. And I know because I've preached for a lot of years, uh, from time to time when I've done a message, like this, I've kind of looked out and I see a few eyes glassing over as people are tuning out because it might sound a little bit like fantasy, like wishful thinking, but I just want to drive the point home today. This is tomorrow's news, maybe not tomorrow on the day, but this is the news of the future for those who have faith in Jesus. It's such an awesome thing. Richard Baxter lived and ministered in the 1600s He was a very effective pastor in England. His whole adult life was spent battling one sickness after the other. He was harassed by a constant cough, frequent nosebleeds, migraine headaches, digestive ailments, kidney stones, and gallstones. He believed in supernatural healing and said several times he was restored to fruitful labor because of God's direct intervention. He said once a cancerous-looking tumor in his throat vanished while he was in the pulpit testifying to God's mercies in his own life, yet bodily suffering was with him to the end. And he once said that from the age of 21, there was seldom an hour free from pain. I'm not reading that to depress you, but I'm reading it to make this point that we see now. One of the effects of this suffering was to make him intensely conscious of how temporary his life is and how inevitable death is. Once when he was 35, he was bedbound by one of his diseases and thought he would probably not recover. He began to meditate on the joys of heaven and the age to come in preparation for leaving this world. He focused especially on the hope of glory and began to write his thoughts. To his surprise, he recovered and his thoughts became a book entitled The Saint's Everlasting Rest. He took up the practice of meditating on heaven a half an hour each day because of the powerful impact it had on his life. He commended the same thing to his readers. 
This is an incredible story of someone that, that lived a lifetime, like many of us do, with struggles and setbacks, but he focused on the Lord and on the things that are ahead, and uh, that gave him the grace and the strength. I was, uh, when I was being raised as a young man, there was a myth that went around, and it, it sounded like truth, but it was this. Some people are so heavenly-minded, they're of no earthly use. Can I just tell you that's impossible? case usually is we're so earthly minded we're you know heavenly used now i'm not labeling you with that but i'm just saying but there's this there's something here that the lord has for us how much do you think about heaven and i want to talk about the four ways that god will make all things new are you ready if you take notes or whatever number one is this morally and spiritually new god will make us morally and spiritually new I think one of the greatest frustrations we as Christians have in life is that we want to be holy, but we find ourselves being sinful. We want to be loving, but we find ourselves blurting out unkind words, thoughtless words. You know, we want to worship, but we feel cold in our soul and in our spirit. We want to be pure in our thoughts, but impurity bombards our minds. If you're human like me, you know that what I'm saying bears truth in it. The Apostle Paul said, you know, the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. The things I want to do, should do, I find myself not doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. And so we're going, that's all going to change. Now, now, by God's grace through prayer and the word and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God gives us grace. And how many of you know, we, how many do you know that as we follow the Lord, sins get less and less and less? I don't think we ever disappear from failure and sin. But it gets less because we learn to walk in the grace of God. But when the Lord comes and sets up his kingdom, I want to read a verse to you here that Romans 8, 23. I think it'll be up there. Uh, the Holy Spirit within us gives us a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something we don't need, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently for it. So there's a longing in our hearts for that uh, coming into the fullness of, of my holiness and strength and purity and walk of life. I just want to pause for a moment here because I know exactly what I'm trying to say, but I have no idea what you're hearing um, but how many of you can just agree with me on that say Lord I know you're in process bringing me to greater grace and greater purity and I open my heart to that again today in a new dimension amen Revelation 21 9 to 11 says this then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came to me and said come with me I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb I just want to drive this point home to you today. We are the bride of Christ. Now, some of the guys might say, you know, I'm a dude, you know, but I want to know if, if women can be sons of God, the men can be the bride of Christ, okay? So, so we're all in this thing together. But he's coming for us. God is going to prepare us in purity. And uh, so he sees this revelation, uh, John does, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. The bride of Christ, it's saying here that you could see through us. When we get into that glorious state, you can see all the way through me. You can't see any sin, any blemish, any lack of integrity, any wrong motives. You're just going to see the perfection of Jesus inside of each one of our lives. Can you say amen for that? Amen for that. So morally and spiritually new. And the next dimension of uh, God making new is physically and bodily new. We will not be uh, disembodied spirits like Plato used to teach that, that somehow will just be kind of like a ghost or a hologram or something floating around you can kind of see it but you can't you can reach through it the, the truth is we're going to have bodies like this except they won't die jesus when he rose from the dead 
he could eat fish, but he could walk through walls. Wouldn't that be cool to walk through a wall, leave your keys at home, and just, here I am. But uh, so we, we, we're going to have new and glorious bodies. Uh, I tell you what, as the years accumulate, I'm kind of looking forward to that too. But uh, Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. If we didn't have a body, he wouldn't be wiping tears. Be no more death, no sorrow, crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. Philippians 3.20, just to, to verify this point here, says this. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Tomorrow's news, God's going to give us brand new bodies that will live forever in health and in strength. Let's take the hands connected to our bodies and applaud the Lord for that goodness, shall we? Thank you, Lord. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name. And then there will be a brand new creation, a brand new earth. God will create an environment that perfectly fits our redeemed spirits and bodies. Revelation 21.1, I read it earlier, but I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth has disappeared. God is going to do some major renovations with his planet and it'll be fit for us. It'll be made perfect again. Romans 8.21, the creation talking about you know, just all of God's created things. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Can you say amen out there? Even creation says, man, uh, it's all God's people are going to be given this brand new start, brand new bodies, and we're going to be renewed in creation as well. Second Peter 3. And I'm reading a lot of scripture because we lay the foundation for what we believe. We place our hope on the living word of God, not on the ramblings and, and comments of men, but on the holy scriptures. Second Peter 3, but the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire in the earth. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire. The elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward. Would you read, would you read this to me? But in keeping his promise, would you read that aloud? We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. We are looking forward to that and we will one day it, it'll just be amazing but one of these days uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see each other and we'll say you know everything that that uh, God promised is true here we are new heavens new earth new bodies new souls sin free living forever and God's destiny and creativity will continue to unfold for us I believe through all eternity all right Isaiah 11 6 to 9 I, I kind of like this one too He's given that this new heavens and new earth. He's given us a picture here, Isaiah is, of uh, what that's going to look like. And that day the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with a baby goat. <laughs> the calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. I like watching these nature shows. Boy, they get real gruesome sometimes when uh, these lions are hungry. Whoever's in his way is in trouble. But... Uh, a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. A baby will play near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. I don't like snakes very much, but I'm glad they're going to be harmless when uh, we get to that day. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as the waters fill the sea... So the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Brand new souls, spiritually, morally. Brand new bodies. A brand new earth. And here's the very best part. A brand new and deep relationship with God. The Bible says no one has seen God. Can you say amen? Yes. No one has seen God at any time. But we will there because he will personally be with us 
I, I love Revelation 21, 3. I read it earlier, but I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. God himself will be with them. A new, perfect, close, intimate relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 5, 6. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body like us today or away from this body when we go to be with the Lord, our goal is to please him, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. I need to, uh, as we kind of wrap this up, you're going to get out early today. Now I can, I can keep talking for a bit more. <laughs> we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account, but not for our sins. Can I tell you that? Can you say amen? God will never bring up our sins again as far as the east is from the west. If we have repented of them and we turn, we will give an account. What did I do with my time? What did I do with my testimony? What did I do with the gospel? Imagine Jesus, when we meet him, when we all meet him individually. When we meet him, imagine he, he says, did you, did you bring anyone with you? I mean, he would know that, but it would be a rhetorical question. Did you bring anyone with you? You know, just the witnessing and loving and sharing and being intentional about seeing people come to the Lord. We will, t we will have that personal time with him. And may I just say, I was raised with the coming of Christ was more of a threat to behave. Johnny, be good. I think it's a song like that, isn't it? But Johnny, be good. And, and uh, it was kind of like, because, and, and I was raised in a real strict church. If you were caught at the movies, uh, when Jesus comes back, you won't go up in the rapture. You'll have to go through the, per the tribulation. I don't believe that today, but there's certain movies I wouldn't want to be caught, Jesus coming back and me watching. I don't watch them anymore, but... Uh, um, so, but the, it's, I, I was raised with it kind of being like a threat, uh, and, and uh, to put fear into me, but can I tell you something here, and we'll be, we will be closing in a few minutes, but the, the coming of the Lord, looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth, the looking forward to the return of Jesus, was never to be something to make us fearful and anxious and, and worried. It's not a threat. It's a personal, precious promise to us. For you, this is a personal, precious promise that Jesus is coming back for you. And even when we stand before his judgment seat, the Bema seat in the Greek uh, was just uh, a platform, not near this high, but people would come down and the judge would be maybe about a foot off the, the main level. And uh, that's where he would determine people's cases. But I believe Jesus will step down and he'll come and give you a hug. It's a precious promise. I believe he will. You might say, oh, but I've done some rotten things. His blood absolutely 100% took care of the rotten things when you came to him. And he will give you a hug and he'll say, I'm so glad you put your faith in what I did on the cross. Welcome home. Welcome home. Then he might say, you know, how come you hogged all your money and didn't help the poor? I don't know, but, but uh, we get in by grace alone, by faith in him. So it's a precious promise. It's not just a threat. We should be responsible with that, knowing that he is coming, but it should not be a horrible threat to us. So that scripture that says we will be judged, just to clarify that. The other thing is I want us to hear a warning in uh, Revelation 21.8, I read that verse, cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, immoral, practicing witchcraft, idol worshipers, liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. What I want us to capture there is there, there is a warning because 
As much as it, it doesn't give me any great joy to say this, except I do say it because it is truth. It's not everybody has religion and glory. It's not everybody goes to heaven. The truth is there's one way through Jesus. And, it's, and so there might be someone here today that's wondered about that, or, or, or you, maybe you've been nudged by the Holy Spirit to commit your life to Christ, but you're not sure that there is a warning in this that those who continue in a lifestyle rejecting Christ and just continue to follow all the wickedness that, that their heart calls them to, there's a warning there. But there's also a tremendous promise in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to this. Here's where God always comes in with the offer of grace. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. <laughs> you were made holy. You're holy because of Jesus. You were made right with God when you called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Isn't this a wonderful gospel that we have and that we share today? Absolutely amazing. So what, what, what John saw, these streets of gold, beautiful rivers and trees, <clears throat> all the worship going on in heaven, and what we covered in the last 40 weeks of this study together, it stretches the limits of language to describe what's ahead for us. And I want every brother and sister in this room to hear this. We know the world's pain and losses. Even as believers in Jesus, we know the pains that come, the losses, the relationships, the brokenness, the disappointments. But let me promise you, God personally wipes every tear from our eyes. Every wrong will be made right. Can I tell you, every hurt you've ever had in your life will be healed. Every disappointment will be healed. Every loss will be restored in that day. Everything that is wrong on earth will be gone, and everything that was good in God will be ours. Some say, why is the Lord delaying? Have you ever wondered about that? Why is the Lord delaying his return? Seems like now would be a good time to come back. First Peter, we read this. Second Peter, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, his return. As some people think, no, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent and come to him. I was... Uh, it was December, month of December, some years ago. And I would call my, my aunt, my dad's oldest sister, at Christmas time. She was my biggest mentor and fan over many, many years. She prayed for me and Jan and the kids all the time. And uh, I'd call her and wish her a Merry Christmas. She was in her 90s then. I was honored to officiate her funeral a few years after that. She was just short of her 100th birthday. She had 144 in her immediate family. She had eight kids, and they all had a bunch of them. Can you imagine Christmas gifts? You don't even remember all their names at that point. And on the day, on the day of the funeral, uh, there was another one born, a great great granddaughter. But anyways, Annie Claude was just she was just a gem. Her name was Claudia, but we called her Claude. Sounds kind of crude, but and uh, I said, Annie Claude, would you? We talked for a while. Would you pray a blessing over me? And sure, Johnny. She would grew up in England she still had that accent <clears throat> and uh, so she prayed for me then she said Johnny remember keep preaching the word I said I will Andy Claude and she said remember Johnny the Lord's coming soon I said yeah and she said we need to be ready don't we and we, we signed off and I want to tell you something I sat down i was alone in the house i sat down i was in our upstairs bedroom and i sat on a chair in there and i started to sob i just sobbed 
I said, Lord, I, I haven't been looking forward to your coming. I preach about it, and I'm glad it's out there, but it hasn't touched my soul. It hasn't been very real to me. It's just been intellectual. And I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit did something in me that day that I've been praying this week would settle down right on these services today. And the Holy Spirit would do a re-tenderizing of our hearts to the coming of Jesus, to the new heavens and the new earth. And in that process that he would just cleanse us from things that tend to cling to us, whether it's materialism or depression or discontent, whatever it is, that the Holy Spirit would come because the best is all ahead for the saints of God. The best is all yet ahead for us. Amen. Give him praise. Give him praise. And so I, I, I close, close with this question. I want to read a quote to you that has been a, a challenge or just blessed me for many, many years. C.S. Lewis made this statement. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. That's the truth. That's the truth. So I, after I had a good cry, I began to read more and think more about the coming of the Lord. And I think what Richard Baxter said, we'd be wise every day to take at least a few minutes and sit down and, and meditate on these scriptures, that Jesus is coming back and he's creating a new heavens and a new earth. And, uh, all of the stuff that has been wrecked in our life will all be put back together. It'll be gone forever, the Word of God says. So if you'd bow your heads for a moment, I just want to ask if there's anyone here, you'd say, John, I would be brave enough to lift your hand and say, I, there's something is stirring in me that says, I, I don't, maybe you're ready because you've accepted the Lord, but you feel there's been a carelessness and you might have a little embarrassment and shame when the Lord does come back. I don't know. But if you would just say, like I have Holy Spirit, please make this real to me. Please make this real to me. And Lord, please touch my heart. Or just raise your hand. I have mine up because I'm always having to be resensitized to this marvelous truth. Anyone out there? Yes, I see. Yeah, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. If you've never received Jesus, if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You can do that this morning. We'll have, have prayer partners up here, either side of this a platform, to pray with you. Great, awesome, best decision you can make in your life is to receive Him as your Lord and Savior. So, Lord, I thank you for this church, these precious people. Lord, because I know quite a few of them personally now, know some of the things they've gone through and are going through, some of the tough stuff. Lord, it's you know it's so easy for us to just focus on everything that we're experiencing, feeling, seeing. But Lord, you're asking us to look higher. And I'm asking you today, Lord, just like a blanket of goodness and grace, settle down upon us. And Lord, help us to do what your word says, to set our affection on things above. Help us to focus on these marvelous things that will keep our joy full. It will keep our confidence strong. It will keep our faith where it should be, locked into you, Lord, no matter what we're going through at this time. Lord, I just pray that you will, in a beautiful way, pour out your spirit upon us. Lord, thank you for the Bible. <laughs> thank you for this awesome 40 weeks of of looking, just looking at all these major stories and incidents and encounters with you, Lord. And now with this very last one, the new heaven and the new earth, we say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you would stand with me.